My name is Christine Beck, and uh, I am a, a poet. I'm an essay writer. I'm a teacher of literature. I'm interested in a wide range of topics. Um, I'm going to share with you today an essay that I've been working on. I'm also going to be posting it on my website, which is christinebeck.net. I invite you to take a look there. Um, but um, I'm going to be introducing um, some poets and talking about how I work with literature in connection with topics that are of great importance in our society today. I'm also the former, uh, a former poet laureate of the town of West Hartford. Um, so that was a privilege for me to be able to bring poetry to my town. So this essay that I'm working on is called, Let's Get in the Car. Um, the black poet, Claudia Rankin, who teaches at Yale, um, recently was reading from her book, Citizen. And she said that after she read from her book, um, a white man came up to her and he said, what can I do for you? And she said, that's the wrong question. The question is, what can you do for yourself? I thought that was really telling. And shortly thereafter, uh, Rankin did a podcast with Krista Tippett, and she titled her podcast, How Can I Talk So We Can Stay in This Car Together? So I'm going to take up Rankin's invitation. I'm going to put some people in a car and see what kind of conversation we can have. Now, you might be saying right now, Christine Beck, who are you? And in the words of uh, Emily Dickinson, I'm going to say, I'm nobody. Who are you? But I think what Rankin was inviting us to do was to think about how we can have a conversation where white people talk about race as if it is something that is actually important in their lives. That it's not just an academic conversation or an excuse for the status quo, but something that actually matters. So like Rankin, I'm a poet and a teacher, although certainly not of her caliber. But as a teacher of literature, I engage in a deep reading of the work of other writers, both poets and writers of other kinds of fiction. We know today that there are a multitude of voices, both um, in the news, um, certainly bandied about in the media, um, about what is euphemistically called the racial climate. And those voices are different from the ones that I'm going to suggest we look at in literature. So it's not as if there aren't important debates being held right now in our public arenas, but I believe that literature brings a unique perspective into questions of injustice, or race because literature brings in one voice. In addition to that, literature asks us to look at narrative, metaphor, image, in ways that perhaps get lost in the current um, ferocious debates. So Emily Dickinson said that a poet should come at things slant. And I think that that's what literature does for us it brings us kind of crosswise into the debates. So here's what I start thinking about. Let's assume we're gonna put some people in Claudia Rankin's car. First of all, it's gonna be a big enough car to hold five or six people. And I then said to myself, now what? So if I'm smart, I'm not gonna start the conversation. If I'm smart, I'm going to invite some other folks into the car first. So who first? First, I decided I was going to invite Gwendolyn Brooks. So I often teach Gwendolyn Brooks' poem, Beverly Hills, Chicago. It happens to be a poem where there are some people, yes, in a car. They're in a car and they're outside a beautiful mansion in a town called Beverly Hills, Chicago. We don't know how many people are in the car. We don't know their race, but we do know that they are looking at this mansion with mixed feelings. There is definitely a feeling that the people in the mansion are perhaps a little better than the people in the car. For example, in the poem, she says even their trash 
looks beautiful. We know these people feel marginalized, perhaps envious. There is a hint in the poem of someone in the basement, someone who is ironing, listening to a song called Knock Me a Kiss. So a bit of research tells us that that song is jazz and that it was made famous by Ella Fitzgerald. Brooks writes in her poem, quote, nobody is furious. Nobody hates these people, at least nobody driving by in this car. She leaves the corollary hanging in the air. Who is furious? Who does hate? Is it justified? At the end of the poem, the folks in the car admit that they want a bit more of what is tantalizingly dangled in front of them. So they say, quote, we do not want them to have less, but it is only natural that we should want to have more. This statement on its face is equable, restrained. After all, who can argue with granting the rich their good fortune, but wanting a little bit besides? No one in the car throws a rock or breaks a window, but at the very end of the poem, there is the phrase, our voices are a little gruff. Are we meant to hear a rhyme with the unspoken word rough? We might fail to notice, but it is crucial. It colors the poem. It adds a shade of irony or maybe pain. If Brooks were in Rankin's car, I think I'd ask her whether she'd want to revise her poem based on what we know today of the disparity in income between blacks and whites. Maybe her poem would shift a little more into the fury side. Well, I'd also invite Phyllis Wheatley into the car. Cars were not invented in the 1700s when Wheatley, at the age of seven, was brought from Africa to Boston as a slave, although she was called a servant, when she was purchased to work for Susanna Wheatley, from whom she got her name. The Wheatleys taught her to read and write, and she began to write poetry. In fact, they even took her to London to see if they could find benefactors for publishing her work. Wheatley is often credited as the first black female published poet in America. So um, I teach Wheatley's poem called On Being Brought from Africa to America, written in 1773, in part because her language is very perplexing. She says, quote, some view our sable race with scornful eye. Their color is a diabolic dye. Remember, Christians, Negroes, black as Cain, may be refined and join the angelic train. So Wheatley may have been polite, but I do not believe she felt she was diabolic, nor that she was the devil. Some critics say that this poem shows that Wheatley was actually grateful for slavery because it brought her to Christianity. My feeling is, there's a bit of irony in this poem. Wheatley perhaps can take her seat next to Gwendolyn Brooks in the irony car. By the way, Wheatley was emancipated at the age of 20 after her benefactors died uh, in 1774. And she died at the age of 31, a scullery maid, destitute. Irony? So the idea of a black woman like Wheatley writing for a black audience, excuse me, for a white audience, became a cause celebre centuries later through its opposite, which was a white man daring to write about black lives. The white poet, Tony Hoagland, in his poem, The Change, presents two men who are watching uh, what appears to be the famous Wimbledon tennis match in which Venus Williams defeated Steffi Graf. So, the speaker in the poem uses emotionally charged racist language. There's no doubt about that. 
He says, quote, some tough little European blonde pitted against that big black girl from Alabama, corn road hair and Zulu bangles on her arms, some outrageous name like Vandella Aphrodite. So Hoagland is clearly being provocative, even though the end of the poem contains a statement about a change in society having taken place. He actually makes fun of the judge who is awarding the cup to Venus Williams. And he says, quote, and the little pink judge had to climb up on a box to put the ribbon on her neck, still managing to smile into the camera flash, even though everything was changing. And in fact, everything had already changed. Poof, remember? It was the 20th century, almost gone. We were there, and when we went to put it back where it belonged, it was past us, and we were changed. Well, Claudia Rankin, you remember this is her car we're talking about, presented her reaction to this poem in 2011 in Washington, D.C. at the meeting of the Association of Writers and Writing Programs, and I, I happened to be there at that session. Um, Tony Hoagland was not there. But Rankin asked the poet Nick Flynn to read the poem, The Change. She said she'd written to Hoagland to protest, how can I locate myself in this poem? To which she said, Hoagland replied, I didn't write this poem for you. This poem is for white people. Well, that only added to the controversy. Did Hoagland's rhetorical strategy create the firestorm that he had hoped for? Perhaps. He continued to read the poem at conferences. Uh, Rankin's public excoriation of Hoagland then took place over the internet after that meeting at AWP. Um, and one of the questions I think it raised was, can or should a writer address his or her work to a specific audience? Who gets excluded? Who gets to complain? All very good topics to discuss. And then there's Matthew Dickman, the last person I'd like to invite into the car. His poem for Ian Sullivan upon joining the East Side White Pride was published in the New York Times Magazine in February of 2018. So this poem is about, ostensibly, a white nationalist who, quote, even now, even now, even now, no one can say you were never a child, quote. Yet as an adult, Dickman imagines someone who is so rageful, so battle-dressed that, quote, people cross the street when they see you like you were black, end quote. What would Rankin say of Dickman's appropriation of the avoidance by whites of blacks in this poem. Rankin, who in her book Citizen, recounts a woman parked next to her in a parking lot, who upon seeing Rankin, starts her car up and moves it to the other end of the lot. So here we are in the car. Rankin, Hoagland, Wheatley, Brooks, and Dickman three black female poets, and two white male poets. Question, do we let anyone out of the curb? What are they going to talk about? What are we going to talk about?